like it never after every door every single one of these. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Using new tech. I'm like, whoa. First time. Right. Right. All right. <laughs> and we are live. Hey everybody, it is Brent Simpson and Denzel Leon Noble here. We're we for those of you all who don't know us, we've been friends since we were what fourth grade, so whatever age that is. Nine like nine years old. And so we've been friends over 30 years. During our time as friends, we've done a lot of business together. Um, we've also been really fortunate to have started investing in the stock market when we were age right around 15. Um, during the time we were really exploring stocks, we started off with mutual funds. And you know we were avid mutual fund like investors. We started reading the business section. We actually read the prospectus for our mutual fund, which pretty much no one reads the prospectus. <laughs> Professionals don't even do that. <laughs> yeah, they don't. <laughs> and then we learned that each of these mutual funds that we were invested in had what's called an underlying. And the underlying inside of those mutual funds was the pool of stock that they owned. And of course, Leon and I deconstructed it and thought, well, why shouldn't we just go buy the stocks? And that really led into us investing in the stock market between the ages of 15 and 16. Um, now, with that being said, we, we also noticed that there were very few friends in high school who were investing in the stock market. But it's a great way to make money, and a lot of people weren't sharing it. So... A lot has transpired since, you know, high school. And I can give you both of our stories, but I'll let Leon tell you a little bit more about himself and his story. Yeah, so um, so yeah, as Brent said, we uh we started in high in high school. The funny thing is that the way we got the money was um <laughs> so we got kids, we hired we essentially hired kids in high school to sell candy for us. Um and what we did, we put them on a contract and said, you know, okay, if you sell X amount you get to keep a certain percentage and you give us the rest. Um, and that was kind of the way we, we, we raised money prior to, you know, getting our jobs at like <laughs> giant food where we both worked. Um, but that was one way we, we kind of, we kind of brought money into to start investing in the market. Um, from there, uh, we did it all through generally through college um, and up into, you know, our, our, our working lives uh, for me. So I was, I worked, my background is in it. Uh, I worked for uh, Booz Allen and Accenture um, up until, couple of years ago, a few years ago. Um, so basically while I was working there, I actually, I was always trading uh, and investing while at work. Um, and I noticed in the last two years before I left my job that I was starting to, to equal my income. And at one point I started exceeding my income by investing and trading versus my job. Uh, so one day I, I made the jump and just um, put in my two weeks notice and left and, and have been investing and in, in trading ever since. Now, um, what I was doing then, what, I'm do- what I was doing then mainly what I'm doing now uh, kind of partially is without what I was doing was uh, options on futures, and that's a whole other discussion we'll probably have in a, another well, time. You know, Leon, give them a brief overview of what options on futures means. Well, what are futures? Let's start there. Well, so futures, so when I say futures, I mean things like um, oil, natural gas, uh, gold, so commodity, commodity futures. So futures are basically just uh, uh, an investment vehicle where people are betting on the future value of, of an underlying commodity. Um, and they're, they're very volatile and they're very, um, they're, so tell me what a stock, a $1 move equals, if you have one share, it equals, um, so, so if it goes up a dollar, you make or lose a dollar. In futures, uh, they're actually leveraged. So a $1 move could equal a thousand dollars, gain or loss. So they're, they're very, very risky when you buy the underlying futures contract. What options do, options actually lessen that risk, um, because they, they give you a way to, to play that, that same volatility with, with, with um, with less, uh, money on the line, so to speak, and like I said, it can it can be a lot deeper, but but generally, no, they just um, options are a way to bet on the future value of a commodity. Uh, so I was doing that for for quite a few years. I'm still doing it now, um, but I noticed in the last like I don't know, so beginning of 2019, no, sorry, mid 2019, I remember hearing that. So I was, during this time, I was also still doing stocks, but really, really uh, low key and in the background. Um, I would I would buy and buy here and there, just kind of on like IPOs. I was I was taking more or less bets. I wasn't really looking for income. Um, I was looking for like home loans. But I remember hearing in like April, May that the market was up like 13, 14%. And um, typically the market in a year goes up 10% in a whole year, 12 months. So I heard that it was a return. Including the dividend. So without the dividend. 
So, so yes, that so that was so what I heard was um what wasn't to, so total return is what Brent's talking about. Total return includes dividends. This was just the um the appreciation of, of the stocks without dividends. Um, so this was through like April May. It was at like thirteen percent. I remember thinking, well, damn, I'm over here kind of messing around with stocks not really doing anything. Kind of just looking at IPOs and, and quick hits, whereas I missed out on fifty percent actually taking 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 the market seriously, taking stocks here. So I was like, okay, cool. Let me let me let me kind of commit more time and more resources into um, kind of moving some money out of, out of uh, options into in, out of futures options into the stock market. Um, so like June, like May, June, I really started to kind of buckle down and put my, so one thing I learned in options is that because, because of the volatility of the futures market, um, options can be, they can be risky if you don't know what you're doing, but if you know what you're doing, you have an objective plan in place, um, they can be very lucrative. And I learned in that process that it's, it's always good to have an objective process in place and leave emotion and um, opinion out of it. So prior to me actually jumping back in the stock market, I said, okay, let me put a process in place. Um, so it took like two months um, and, I, and, I have, and I have an objective process that the way I choose my stocks, the way I research my stocks, the way I buy my stocks. Um, and so from June, it was like June, July, June, I really started putting the process in place. July and August is when I really started diving in. Um, and then by the end of the year, um, the market returned about 17% for the rest of the year. And I returned uh, 20%. So I beat the market in about six months. I created alpha in about, of about 3%. Um, so alpha is, um, the term alpha just means uh, any, any, um, any amount above and beyond what the general market makes. So market did like 30-ish percent and I did like 30, well, again, for six months, the market did 20%, market did 17%, I did about 20%. Um, so that really, that really showed me, again, even the stocks that once you have that objective process in place, you know, um, you can, you know, do very well, just like I did, um, just like I'm still doing in, in options now, futures options. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically my story up until, and then this year, as we all know, we've all taken a massive hit, uh, in the market. Um, but with not Brent all, and I, not all. Uh, well, well, no, I'm saying since January 1. Yes. I mean, since, since January, I'm saying since, since January 1 through now, the market's down 30%. Um, but like Brent and I have been doing it. We, and, and so the other thing is, is it's like Brent and I realized during this time we were both getting hit up by friends and family like yo what are you doing um what should i do i'm not an advisor you know brent brent more is but um but I'm, i just tell people what i'm doing yeah. um and what i'm about your body is, is look i'm buying like i'm buying hand over fists right now um because i always remember and i was kicking myself that back in 2009 eight during the credit crisis and brent and i were talking about this yesterday we both i saw bank of america at two dollars during the credit crisis, it got, got down to two bucks. The largest bank in America got down to two dollars. I mean, well under book value. I mean, just ridiculously under book value. Um, and I didn't buy um, because at that time I was I was scared. You know, I was afraid all the, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Not later. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, looking back now, I mean, Bank of America before this recent crash was at forty plus dollars. So you're talking like a you know four thousand percent return. Yeah, and it's um, still trading at nineteen dollars a share right now. Yeah, right, and that, that's after the drop. It was it was at forty, yeah. Um, so that taught me, you know, in these times of complete panic, this is the time you want to buy. So at every big drop we've had this year, you know, four or five, ten percent, I've been dropping, you know, buying a little bit, buying a little here, buying a little there. I'm spreading it out across industries and across sectors, so I'm not, you know, exposed to one. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 totally loving, currently loving this market. Looking at my account isn't great, but I know in a year, you know, two three years out. You know, it's going to be a major home run. So, yeah. And so, for me on my side, um, I used to be uh, licensed with the NASD SEC, and I was one of those guys. You know, I had I, I came out of college and I was a stockbroker. I had a Series Seven, Series Six, Sixty Three, Sixty Five Life and Health, and I loved it. Like I loved everything about the market. Um, but the and the really the important piece is. Because Leon and I had that experience actually investing when through high school into college, in college we launched an investment club because again, in the 1998 time frame, 97, you literally could throw a dart at a board and whatever you hit, it was gonna run. The dot com, yep, yeah, yeah. It was a dot com boom. And so yeah. in the dot com boom, there were a lot of people who were nervous because it was new. And it wasn't, it was a it wasn't the same exact situation we're in now but it was a depressed market because people didn't know what was going to happen. But then also it was, once it started exploding, it was like 98, 99. But 97 is when it came on the scene, 96, 97. And so in 97, we actually created our first 
LLC through Harvard Business Center. It was called <laughs> Wealth Enterprise Investment Club. We wanted, we were interested in investing. We were interested in helping people invest, but we needed a framework by which to do it. So we created Wealth Enterprise Investment Club. So at the age of, I, I, we had to have been 19, we, we would be those people like nobody expected to really be killing it, but we would have like a couple thousand in our pocket walking around campus and nobody knew. And right. at one point in time, it was a run in Qualcomm. Qualcomm had the patent on digital technology. So no matter who had a cell phone, if it was digital, they had to have Qualcomm technology in it. Qualcomm had a 700% run over mm -hmm. like a nine month period. And it was, it was insane. But it reminded me that, that that wasn't even the biggest run that Leon had saw in the stock. It was, we used to pick stock picks and we would go to each other, like whoever had the strongest argument on a Saturday about whatever they read in the business section of the Wall Street, I mean, uh, Washington. I mean, I invested well, business daily. Yeah. Times. It might've been invested business daily, but either way, yeah. we would we would set up times for us to discuss a stock. And whoever had the strongest argument, we would just go buy the stock. It didn't matter if we agreed or not. That was our, that was our rule. So that's what we did. And it was just one company. You know what I'm going to say, Leon? <laughs> you name. <laughs> this company was like, it ended up being like a 2,000, would, would have been a 2,000% return. And, um, you know, one of us didn't win that argument, so we didn't go with UnionNet. But at the time, it was a great experience because it taught us that the market really could produce this type of return. So I would actually say the pain was good because it taught us not only are, is, is everything obvious, but sometimes the things that weren't obvious were great investments. And mm -hmm. leading that to now, we're there. We're in that space. And like Leon said, you know, we were getting phone calls and I'm no longer a licensed um, financial advisor. So in this Literally. space, everything we're saying is conversational. None of this is professional advice for what you should do. However, this is advice to say, what is happening in the market can be amazing if you choose to look at it as such. Um, we also know that it's a lot of people right now just trying to pay bills mm -hmm. or trying to stay afloat. So you may not want to run out and invest money into the market. And we don't suggest, although it is a strategy some people use, taking loans to invest because now is the down period. And when it bounces back, I'm going to get more than what I owe on my loan. We're not suggesting any of that, although they are strategies people use. We're simply saying the market is a great place to invest right now. And because, and we're actually, for everybody who sticks around, we're going to give two stock picks of our own, on one from Leon, one from myself, on what you should buy. And we hope that you stick around to the end to, to hear what those are. And then every week or every other week, we're still trying to work it out. We're actually going to start going doing these lives where we give two stock picks per week or every other week um, that we, we think is something that you should at least give strong consideration to. And with that being said, the reason for it is Leon, how long has it been since you actually had a job? Um, 2013, 13 or so, 13, 13, 14, around there. Yeah. And so seven, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. So, and I remember, I remember when Leon was at Accenture, he was like, man, I'm going to quit. And I was like, <laughs> it's the new job. And he was like, I'm trading, I'm trading stock. Oh, no, I'm doing options trading. And I remember thinking, like, hold on, you're going to leave your job. And at the time, I was a licensed stockbroker. So for me, I was still trying to digest this. I was like, you're going to leave your job, and you're just going to trade options? And remember, you weren't, and you weren't too familiar with what options really were, which some people still aren't at no. the time. So, yeah. And that's, you know what? I'm glad you said that, because that's what I realized being a financial advisor, is that there are a number of financial advisors out there that don't know every financial <laughs> product. And you can't. There are too many. They're roughly, I think you said, what was the number, Lee? Like 8,000 stocks that are trading actively? They're more than that, but. Well, the well, ones that are actually tradable by, by volume, um, basically the ones that the big institutions trade are roughly between five to 8,000 stocks. And they usually base that on uh, stock price being above five to $10 and um, average daily volume, average daily volume over 50 days of about 200,000 shares. So and that, more, that roughly like five to 8,000 really tradable stocks. And when you think about tradable stocks, and when he said institutional investors, institutional investors are large purchases of stock. So you have your brokerage houses, you have your mutual funds, you have um, trust 
in some cases you have banks, they become institutional investors. And when they move, hedge. but- No, say hedge funds. Hedge funds. And when they buy large blocks of stocks, they can become movers of the price because those blocks can actually change the price of the stock. But so anyway, and that's part of this too. We're going to start providing investor education along the way. So we're going to be doing these conversations so you all understand some of the language around stocks. And if you have questions, this is your opportunity to ask. I've been over, I've been in financial professionally in financial services over 19 years. Leon and I have been trading over 15 years. Yeah. Uh, more than that. I mean, we started, you know, at, you know, like yeah. freshman year, freshman, sophomore year. So we were 15, 16. Yeah. So, I mean, we have well over, like we're in like 19 years of like professional, well, not professional, but trading. So we've seen a lot. We've read a lot. We've talked to a lot of people. We've invested ourselves. Um, Leon's now moving into real estate because he made so, not, I'm just trying to put the business. He's done well enough that he can use the money there and purchase houses. My first home purchase, I used part stock money when I was 21. And my first home was a single family detached home, like two cars paid off, motorcycle paid off. And it was because we were doing, we had diversified how we made money. And now, you know, you come full circle like 20 years later and we're like, you know what? We really should share this information. And right now we've gotten so many phone calls from people like, how do you buy in a depressed market? And do you buy in a depressed market or do we wait for the recovery to start? Or do we just kind of wait for the newspaper to tell us it's time to go? Mm -hmm. But you know, by then it's way too late. So, yeah. And so you can do what's called dollar cost averaging. And when you create a dollar cost averaging system for yourself, it's a very simple way of saying consistently invest money. That's it. Yeah. Um, you dollar cost average down, and you can dollar cost average up, which gives you an average price. And that's what I've been doing in this in this drop. So I actually started buying. Um, I actually started buying in, in this particular uh, depressed market. What is this? This is in about like around uh, March 10th. I started. Um, so so what I noticed is the market. The market topped out uh, uh, about March 10th um, is when I, when I, if I remember from my research, topped out on March 10th and we dropped roughly um, 30% in 20 days. Um, and I, I, Before you go down that, because I, I know what you're about to say and it's going to be great information. For anybody who's watching this right now and you want to share this with a friend so they can start to get the, you know, um, ideas of how they can invest or what's happening in the marketplace right now. This, this is the time to share because I know the value that Leon's about to give to you all, and this is a great time to share. So hit the share button, name a friend, name a group, um, share this information. And again, this is just to get us talking about where the what are the opportunities. We're going to give you guys two stock picks at the end. And also just kind of letting you know it can be done. And Leon and I, for many of you all who are watching this, know us. We're very simple people. You know, we're not out taunting we're not trying to, to stunt and say we did this. You can get hurt in the market, but you can also experience something extremely beautiful in the market. And, and I, I've, I've been hurt as you as well as you've been hurt. Everyone like this market is never per, not, investing is never perfect. And one thing I one thing I one thing I, I I get frustrated when I when I talk to people is everyone's looking for like this this guaranteed return, this guaranteed riskless return. Yeah. And it's like anytime you put money up, there's a risk. Um, you have to be comfortable with that risk. But a lot of people out here are scared to do it because it's like like people right now look at this market saying, you know, it's too like like when I see people like right now, I've been buying since since the drop happened. They're like, what are you crazy? It's it's going to zero. It's you know it's gonna it's gonna you know the bottom falling out. Well, like I say, I always I always show people. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of history. I love history. So I'll, I'll take people back to the credit crisis, to the dot com bust, to the 1987 crash, and then to the Great Depression. Yeah. Um, all of them, all of them at the time, everyone thought the world was ending, and everyone sold, sold, sold. Was the people that bought at those, you know, not not, not saying the bottom because the, the bottom can only be known after the fact. No one knows where the bottom is until a new high is actually made in the market. So anyone who says they know the bottom, they can print the bottom is it's, it's total BS. Um, but you, as Brett said, you can you can dollar cost average in, so you can buy um, as it drops. But and, and here's another thing: when I'm talking to people, people are like, you know, like how much should I do and how, and you know, I lose all my money. No one's saying put all your money in this. You know, if you have, first it should be risk capital. And risk capital is defined as money you can lose tomorrow. Um, if the market did blow up and the earth the earth ended, if you lost that money, 
You would <laughs> you would still be able to eat, feed your, feed your, feed your kids. Um, we're not talking about money for your college fund. We're not talking about money for, for medicine. We're talking about money that you can actually lose. And then of that money, take a percentage of it. If you have 10 grand that you that, that you can invest um, that's investable, don't use all 10 grand. Take 10, 20 percent. Take a thousand, make two thousand dollars and then take that and then divide it up and then put it put it amongst five different stocks. Diversify and do that as the market drops. And what you see is that your break even um, per stock and per investment will become lower and lower and lower. So instead, instead of the market having to return to all time highs for you to make any money um, because you dollar cost average in and your your um, your your break even is lower as the market returns, you know, just by get 10, 20 percent, you'll make your money. Instead of it having to go back up 100 percent for you to make money. So um so yeah so my I mean, my last main point is 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 just take some money that 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 you can lose and that if you can't lose any money then don't don't invest um but it needs to be money that's risk capital is that money if you lose it tomorrow you still feed your family and you still be able to eat yeah and so when you talk about diversification one of the things I used to say I used to teach um investing to like girls basketball teams and in high schools we we don't have mentors since we were probably in need of a mentor and so. <laughs> We, we learned the hard way. And so when we were going back to, you know, selling candy in high school, it was the biggest blessing to be in Mark Goddard's basement one day when his dad was saying, well, what are you guys going to do with this money? We were making like $250 a week having yeah. people sell candy for us. Uh-huh. And we did that because we walked, my mom, I literally remember, Future Business Leaders of America had to sell candy for an event to raise money for a trip. And I was like, oh my gosh, it, like who gets this money? Mm-hmm. we've always been proponents of deconstructing where the money flow is. And so after deconstructing it, one day my mom took me into Costco, guys. When I say it was a game changer, <laughs> I, was, I mean, I remember calling Leon, like, I don't think I called I might have paged you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there wasn't no calling back then. <laughs> yeah, or I, just, I saw you the next day in school, like, yo, <laughs> I found the mother load. Like, there's this store, it's called Costco, and they have everything you can imagine. And so... To give you an example of what was happening, at Costco at this point in time, you could buy a box of blow pops for $5.99, and it was 100 blow pops in it, and you sold it at a quarter of pop, you made $25. That's over a 200% rate of return. Mm-hmm. Ridiculous. And, and we, so, have multiple, we have multiple people doing this for us. <laughs> yeah, so we, then we, have, we hired people to do it for us at different schools. And anyway, so we came back, we had this money, and somebody was like, what are you going to do with it? And we were like, we're going to own businesses. And we were playing the BMWs we were going to buy and what they would look like. But then we got addicted to the market. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened to us. We got, addic- we got addicted to seeing our money grow. And too many people watching this are addic- uh, like addicted to spending. They're addicted to having. And to have without ownership is ridiculous to me. So even for us back then, when we finally started investing, one of the first things I bought was Costco. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it was literally the first it was I think it might have, no it wasn't the first do you remember what our first stock was? No, I just I remember that you and that data strings thing, but no, I don't remember the first. <laughs> whatever whatever our first stock was, and the reason I say this as Leon talks about diversification, I started diversifying in businesses that I was already spending money at. So right. if I drove a Toyota, then I wanted to own part of Toyota stock. If I was buying this candy to resell. I was getting money from the resale of the candy, and then I was getting money from the appreciation of Costco stock. And now Costco is a dividend paying stock, so now I'm getting money from the dividends of Costco from what I did when I was 15. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that, that is how we start to build generational wealth. That's how we start breaking out of these systems of just walking in the stores as a consumer, waiting for, for a sales clerk coming up to us saying, well, what else can you do? would you like to buy today? And really what they're saying is, how much more money do you want to give us? And we aren't giving you anything back, but this thing that's going to deteriorate or depreciate. Mm-hmm. And so you, we, we're like, we're done. And not only that, we're done being quiet about it. So we are going to come to you all trying to provide this education because the model Leon just gave you, if you were to diversify in five stocks, as he said, and not using medical mo- money you need for medicine, not using money you need for groceries, using money that like, if you, you really invested. You're like, you, you can kind of shrug your shoulders that either I'm going to make it or I'm not. But still, that doesn't mean you make dumb decisions. Right. Mm-hmm. You still make smart, calculated decisions on what you buy. And, it's, and it, this right now is an opportunity for you guys to ask us questions. And even in this platform, how, you know, are you going to use this time to ask? Or are you going to watch this, go back to what you were doing, and think, oh, well, that was good information. 
that's the one thing we didn't do. Like even at 15, when we when we, we had the inclination to go talk to a financial advisor who ripped us off horribly, which is the reason why I became a financial advisor myself, because I didn't want that to ever happen to anybody else. But then it still kept our palates wet for the opportunities that came in the marketplace. And and that and that ripoff situation with that with that um whole insurance issue. Company whose name we won't mention. Yeah, we won't mention, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but that incident, we learned a lot. We learned a lot what to do and what not to do with certain investment vehicles. So, I mean, we were young. Like I said, we were we, we were in our teens. Um, and that situation, uh, again, we were in the market too, but we were also in our teens. So we can take advantage of with an investment. Um, about insurance and 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 about um and about stocks. So um you know even even a, even a bad situation can turn out good as long as you learn from it. Yeah. So let me see. Um, just sh- let me check one thing. Yeah, I think we might have had a technical difficulty. Give me one sec. One sec. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Cool. So we're we're good. So like we said, we we learned from that situation and not only did we learn from it, we, so somebody actually, Dean, he just said, you gotta love insurance companies. Dean, hmm. um, let's, let's talk about insurance companies for a high second then since, and again, if you, as you guys send it out, we'll talk about it. Insurance companies right now are going through a metamorphosis in regards to, they don't know how they're gonna be hit from COVID-19. Is this gonna deplete all of their reserves? Is it gonna force them to increase rates? Is this going to force them to abandon certain um, product lines? And depending on the type of insurance companies, if it's business, business interruption insurance right now is panicking. Is mm-hmm. COVID-19 covered under business interruption insurance? If it is, that means a bunch of insurances are going to be paying some pretty big checks. If right. a life expectancy rate of individuals change because COVID-19 and over time, actuarially speaking, the actuaries, when they're calculating life expectancies, they will have to make adjustments for COVID-19 if it becomes a new norm. And so that means insurance companies are going to probably have to raise rates. So there's an opportunity to buy the insurance companies now because they're confused and they don't know what's going to happen and it's depreciating their, their, um, their valuations on their stock. But you got and with that, And with that, I mean, as we all know, we all know the, the, the great term from 2000, from the credit crisis, too big to fail. Um, insurance companies are too big to fail. Um, they will be bailed out just like they were in 2008, 2009. Um, should they should they uh, be you know decimated at least, on, at least on the books by this this um, this current crisis? So, like Brent said, um, I mean one of the things I've been doing, and like we'll cover kind of our pick later. But one of the things I've been doing is I've been I've been putting money into the industries that are getting absolutely slammed right now, which for me are um, anything around travel and anything around leisure and entertainment. Um, so I've been, I mean, putting money to work hand over fist in those, because again, I learned from the credit crisis that, and especially when the industry, the, the government is told they're going to bail out these industries, right? They're, they're, they're not going to let them fail. Um, so if you have, if you see a company that's discounted by 80%, um, now in two or three years, will it still be down 80%? No, because one, insurance isn't going away. Um, and two, as Brent said, they're probably to raise prices going forward. Um, so their revenues are going to increase, sales are going to increase in, in, in the years to come. So insurance, is, I didn't even think about it actually, but insurance is another industry that um, that could be right right now for for the picking in this crisis. Yeah, and so one of the questions we just got, Leon, is um, a dividends on mutual companies will probably be reduced. And I, I think this question is, is dividend on stocks. Um, yeah, dividend, so if you're talking about dividends on mutual companies, most companies that are mutually owned are private. So they're actually are not publicly traded companies. So when you say dividends on mutual companies, there's two things I can, two ways I can interpret what you're saying. And correct, jump in, send another comment if I'm not answering this the way you intended. But if you were to receive a dividend from a mutual company, that means that you are a private investor in that company, which means you did not go through the stock market to get it. Um, that is possible. And the question is, will dividends be reduced as a result of this? Believe it or not, dividends actually have gone up during this crisis for some companies because they're trying to, I don't know if they're trying to balance out what's happening with the price per share um, dropping or why, but I've seen personally, I'll I'll jump in if you've seen something different. I've seen Mm -hmm. a lot of companies increase their dividends, which I think later on towards the recovery is going to be a decrease in their dividends because they're going to have to adjust 
or what's happened to the actual um, company itself? Well, I've seen, I've seen some of that too, but I've also seen decrease. I've actually seen dividends cut. Some companies are actually cutting their, their dividend to zero. Um, and reason being is again, because their revenues, their revenues have essentially gone to zero for now. And as some of them that have cut into zero, um, they've said that they'll resume once this, this crisis pass, passes. Um, so right now, di- di- the current term dividend investing, people love that term dividend investing um, right now may not be the greatest strategy because again, you don't know if the dividend is safe. Um, yeah. A lot of big companies have actually cut their dividends, either cut them or, or cut them to zero because, because of this, um, this issue. But for me right now, again, in this crisis, I'm not, I don't care about a dividend um, because I know, <laughs> yeah, so, again, when I see something discounted 80%, the dividend is, is, is <laughs> dividends ice in the cake. Um, and I know the dividend's coming back in a year, six months, a year, two years anyway. So that'll be there. Um, but for me, uh, for me in this price right now, the, the discounts I'm seeing are from 30% to 90% on Fortune, uh, sorry, on S&P 100 companies. Uh, S&P 100, it just means the, um, the top. So the S&P 500 is considered, quote unquote, the market. It's the 500 biggest companies in the US. 80% of them pay dividends. Um, and then you have the S&P 100, which is then the cream, the cream of the crop of the S&P 500. Um, some of those have cut dividends, um, which is fine because again they're going to come back. But it, most of those companies, if need be, they'll be bailed out because they're in industry that that um they, they can't that they're too big to fail. So um, for me, dividends aren't things I'm looking at. I'm looking at strictly price appreciation, uh, just because prices are so depressed. And I and I use 2008 2009 as an analog uh, because again I saw Bank of America at two dollars, and before this crisis it was it was um it was at forty dollars. So yeah, you know. the, um, in that Bank of America situation, Leon and I had a talk that day about Bank of America, and I was like, well, "I'm gonna go buy it." <laughs> so right. yeah, yeah. Well, so the cash position on it was, I think, five dollars a share, and it was no seven. It was the cash position on it was seven dollars a share. The stock price was trading at five dollars a share. Right, it was under, yeah. So basically, yeah, you're buying at a cash discount. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it's just it's unbelievable. Yeah, and so when the question come, came up, another question we just received was what stocks are must-have stocks? So again, in the end of this conversation, towards the end, Leon and I are going to give his pick, and I'm going to give you my pick on um, two stocks we're both interested in. I've actually made purchases of it, um, full disclaimer. But, you know, what you all do, don't forget, as we give advice on what stocks are out there, it's not a, it's not a definitive move for you. Still do your research. Um, Use it as only a a place to point you in a direction to say, okay, this is a stock to get. And as we build out, we're working on creating an investment education platform. Um, It's going to be an investor education academy, actually, for people who want to learn more about investing. We're primarily going to be talking about um, stocks in this framework. But we'll (laughs) talk about other investments, be it um, really merger acquisitions in companies, buying private investments in the companies. Um, what is What are pink sheets? What are over-the-counter stocks? You know, all these things we'll be visiting. You know, we might touch on the options piece. We will touch on the options piece um, in real estate, but we're going to focus on stock. And so inside of the Investor Education Academy, um, as it comes out, we, we need you all's input. You know, what is it that you all will want to know about stock? And what is it that you've kind of been playing around with, but you haven't felt comfortable doing it on your own? Because there are a lot of people out here talking about the gurus, find out how we made a thousand percent rate of return in two days in the market. Um, you know, thousand dollars a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, Leon and I know how people um, think, and we know how investments work. And we're not we're not in it for that. We're both we're good. We're both in good positions, but we we're also giving people, and we realize this is why I became a financial advisor in the first place. We got ripped off with in this this company whose name we won't mention. And I was like, I, I never want that to happen to anybody that I know, which drove me to be a financial advisor. And I mean, we were both decorated, so we don't have the name credentials, but we, we've we either been decorated through our education or through what we've actually done. Leon hasn't worked traditional job since the last seven years when he decided to become a full-time trader. Many people can't say that. And in being a full-time trader, let me be very clear for all of you all who are watching. I'm even going to get close to the camera. That doesn't mean everything he did worked at all. So I've been investing. <laughs> I've, I've been a licensed um, stockbroker at one point in time. I have advanced certificates in financial planning from Georgetown and some other things. And w- does that mean that everything I bought was gold? No. I had a stock go to zero on me. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was in the marijuana industry. 
And it was the most interesting thing in the world to watch a stock go to zero because theoretically, I really didn't think it was possible. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's all these things and experiences that led us back to saying, you know what, let's just start sharing this with the world. And we will attract the tribe that wants to come to us, but we need you all. Tell us what it is that you want to know. Um, what is a good information dissemination vehicle for us to get it to you? And, you know, I mean, for today, COVID-19 is very real. And it's having an immediate impact on our stock market. And there will be those who go, you know what? I'm doing a turtle thing and I'm putting my head in my shell. Call me when it's over. And it's those that are like, you know what? I'm going to explore where the opportunities are. And when this is over, I'm going to prosper. Which one do you want to be? And so, you know, with that being said, you, you want to, anything else you want to say, Lee? Yeah. So the, to, just on the question that the person had. So the, the, that question in some ways to me is, is I want I to sound negative, but it's, it, to me, that question is kind of part of the problem, right? So the question to you was what stocks are must owns, right? And he asked, he asked for your opinion, Brent, or us. Um, and to me, so I, I just let everybody know, I'm a very, I'm a data driven guy, right? I don't do, to me, everything is about objectivity and data. Um, I don't, I don't deal in opinions. And, um, and by asking me or asking Brent, asking anybody, which stocks, are the best, you know, the best stocks. To me, that's an opinion. Like if I tell if I tell you Microsoft, um, that's my opinion. Now, if I backed it up with, with, with hardcore data behind it, um, then yeah, then it makes sense. But I, to me, it's just it's, it's, instead of asking what do I think, it, I, I like the more objective question uh, is of um, you know based on fundamentals, based on the economy, based on X Y Z, what are the best stocks to have? Instead of just asking someone their opinion, because that's what they, I mean. That, that's what all these gurus are. These gurus out here that say, oh buy this, buy that, I make a $1,000 a day, yada, yada, yada. But they never show you how they did it, why they did it. They never show the data behind it. They never show their account. They never show the data behind why they make certain choices. Um, and, any, and like Brent said, I mean, I've had many losses. Brent said many losses. You out there have had many losses. No, nothing's perfect. Um, but, it, but it's all about putting the wind behind your, your back the best way by having the data to support uh, a particular investment, um, uh, a p- particular investment in general. So oh, um, Lee, Lee, let me jump in real quick. When we talk about wins and losses i had a family member that i helped build a portfolio for and he, two days ago they came to me like oh can you just check the portfolio and we probably need to change some things and mm-hmm. by the way leon lonnie just got on he said this is great information fellas oh so lonnie Appreciate so it. um fellow options traders <laughs> so <laughs> you know getting get when i looked at the portfolio i before taking a computer to look at the portfolio for this family member i was like well look i know how i set it up it's probably fine, but you know, I'll take a look. They, they had a 233% rate of return on this account. And it was actually down. And but so over, but over how, what was the time frame? 10 years. So they, years. they've been averaging about 23% rate of return for the last 10 years. Right. Mm-hmm. And this is a portfolio. It was play money that we used, though. It was money that they didn't like need because we mm-hmm. didn't know which way. It was a stock in there that was down 80%. So you think about that stock that's down 80%, like, you know, and it's still as a 233% rate of return right. in mm-hmm. your period. And so that's that's pretty cool going into this. Um, what we talk about is we, we didn't try to pick the hot stock. We didn't mm-hmm. look at, and for me also, what I like to do personally is look at the qualitative side of people investing. Like, what is your reason for wanting to even be in the market? Because then mm-hmm. it, it's going to lead me to understanding sustainability. Because I years of experience have taught me this. If you start investing because Leon and I told you what to buy, as soon as the wind blows a different way, you're panicked, you're stressed mm-hmm. out, you're trying to figure out, you know, how do I get my money back because it's going to go to zero? And it could be a 3% move. <laughs> right, right, you're right, yeah. <laughs> but because it was a 3% move in a company that you knew nothing about and you just chose it because we said it, you don't, there's, no, there's no affinity, there's no relationship to that stock. So you mm-hmm. got to think about what is your relationship to the stock in addition to what are the fundamentals of the company you're investing in. And Leon, I just got clarity on that question about um, dividends. Um, so mutual, this is actually a straight up Brent question for real. This is about mm-hmm. what are the dividends on a l- whole life insurance policy for a mutual company? And oh. so when looking at that, you have a couple of mutual companies out there. Um, of the bigger ones would be Mass Mutual and um, Mutual of Omaha, Connecticut Mutual, and I want to say Northwestern Mutual. Those are amongst the bigger insurance companies. 
And when you purchase whole life insurance, in most cases, that means for those that are watching and don't know how whole life insurance works, it becomes, it's, it's intended for life insurance to start there. It is not technically an investment vehicle. And, but the reality is it has a growth in it that works very similar to an investment in the, in the, um, in the way of uh, cash value appreciation. So when you have a, you have stock mutual um, insurance companies and you have mutual insurance companies, what that means is a stock mutual company might be like a state farm or something. That just means that the New York life, that means they have stockholders that they are responsible for paying as the company, you know, issues out um, profit sharing or dividends. Mutual companies don't have that layer. So normally mutual, um, com mutually owned companies, when you buy a life insurance policy or disability or long-term care policy from them, you technically become part owner in that stock, meaning they share in the profits with you through the insurance policies. So when they do that, you're looking at an internal rate of return of the investment. And now in the 2000s, like early 2000s, it was like 11, 12%, it was something crazy. And it got locked in when you bought the insurance policy because it was considered a contract. It still is. But now the premiums that you'll get on those, you're looking at maybe like internal rate of return, 4 or 5%, which isn't bad, but the max that you're probably hitting in those you might get up to like eight, nine. And I say that with trepidation because I haven't run the numbers yet, but that's about where we are. And in that space, it depends on if they issue out dividends in addition to giving you the guaranteed um, return for whatever the insurance amount that you have. So I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also I'll say this too, because some of these um, insurance companies, are they are publicly traded. So for some people, they prefer actually go out and buy the stock of the publicly traded insurance company versus have a policy of a mutual company, unless they were going to do it anyway. If you're going to do it anyway, the biggest thing you want to do is find a strong company that's not going to go under because some of them have gone under because they didn't actuarially price themselves um, to the market. I mean, we're about to go down the whole rabbit hole. Uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let me, let me pull back. That's, that should answer your question. If anybody else has any questions about it, um, a stock or, you know, something like that, please just put it up. Okay, we are getting straight um, ticker symbols. <laughs> yeah. So before we go into the ticker symbols and to, to respect time, um, Dean, please send me a direct message or, or Leon. And you can find Leon at Leon Noble um, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. And you can find me at Business with Brent Simpson. I will go through that ticker symbol with you. Just shoot me a, um, a direct message and we can talk. But... For Lee, again, I'll say before we get off, is there anything that you want to say to people watching about the current market? And if you can let us know what your pick is. Yeah, I mean, I'd say just use history as a guide. Um, at every, if you go back and look at every crash, quote unquote crash in history back to the, I mean, even before the Great Depression, it's, it's kind of hard to find data um, beyond the early 1900s. Um, so we're going back to the Great Depression up through now every market crash um, was the end of the world, right? Every, everything was going to zero. We were all going to die. Uh, and then a year, a year later, so, so here, here's another statistic that um, on average, bear markets last anywhere from 12 to 18 months. Um, so if this is a traditional bear market, this, this, these kind of this chopping up and down could last a year to 18 months. Um, of course, there are some that are shorter, uh, but it could last eight, 12 to 18 months. So what that tells you is that what's going on right now, um, based on history, um, won't last. And um, the market eventually will return to all-time highs and, and move higher. Um, so just, yeah, just, just, just know, just know that you use risk capital. Um, even when you, when you have risk capital, use even a percentage of that and just dollar cost average and just buy it as it goes lower, as it goes lower and you lower your break even. Um, so my, my pick is, um, is Delta Airlines, uh, ticker symbol, ticker symbol D A L D as in dog, A as in Apple and L as in uh, Lonnie. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was Lonnie. <laughs> yeah, that was Lonnie. So the, re the reason for that is, um, the, the main reason is the stock is down 65% in a month. Um, so that's the main reason. But the other reason is that, so I looked at some statistics before this, is that um, airline travel in 2019 was at its highest level ever. This, so in 2019, uh, airline industry carried more passengers than any time in history. It was up 10% from the previous year also. Um, and um, their, Delta's earnings over the, last, over the last three, two or three years has averaged 35%. 
um, and their sales have averaged about five to six percent. And and their dividend uh, at the time before the crash was I think about was I think it was like three percent. Um, so you're talking about a solid solid company, and they're going to be bailed out by the feds. So um, Delta Airline is not going anywhere. Um, they'll be back strong as ever. Like I said, ridership was at an all time high before the crash. Uh, I started buying the stock at forty. Um, I bought it again at twenty, which broke brought my broke which brought my break even to thirty dollars. Right now the stock is at twenty eight dollars. So a two dollar move and I'm back to break even. Anything above thirty dollars, I'm you know I'm in profit. And then again the stock is down from from uh, from I think the high was what is it sixty? The high was I think I think forty fifty or sixty was the high um, beforehand. So so I'm two dollars away from profit. And the reason that now if I if I hadn't dollar cost average in if I bought it at forty and left it at forty alone. Um, I would still need another 12 bucks to, to break even because I then bought again at 20. Um, my break even became 30 and now I'm only $2 away from profit. And that's the power of dollar cost averaging into a stock. Um, so Delta Airlines, DAL is my pick. All right. And so for me, what I'll say to everybody is don't use this opportunity to make panic driven decisions as it relates to investing. Um, if you're out there and you're like, oh, you know what? I'm not making what I was making it work. So I'm gonna go take out a home equity line of credit and invest in the market because it's going to come back. I, I caution you very heavily against that because if you have to take a loan, then you probably don't have um, the capital to take that loss. Specifically risk capital. Yeah, risk capital. And so also, if you're looking at what do I buy and you don't have guidance, try to find guidance, number one. Um, and it can be, it doesn't need to be an actual person. It could be research. It can be reading books. It can be through um, reading blogs, make sure they are reputable companies, um, proven blogs, and people who have experience in the market, and they're not just these get rich quick schemes saying, buy this and these arrows are gonna move in this direction, and you'll be great. And so, um, you know, just watch out for those things. And I'm a proponent of buy what you're doing, buy what you put money into, because you know the pattern, you probably know the history of it as well. I mean, how many of us have shopped at Costco way before this happened? And Costco has a retention rate. This is, this is, I don't know if you guys know this. Costco has a retention rate of about 90% of people who renew their um, memberships. That's like the highest in the industry. 90% compared. Unheard of. Yeah, unheard of. And this is before anything happened. It's just right. going to go up. And so that's not my pick, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan. Because there's so many stories. You guys just keep checking back with us because we're going to have some great stories about some different stocks. Um, but my pick today is um, Zoom, which is what we're on. Again, buy things that I do. <laughs> so <laughs> looking at Zoom though, the reality is they IPO last year at, um, and I think it was April of last year, or right around $60 range. Um, they're now trading about 135 or 120 or 140, somewhere in that space per share. The ticker symbol is ZM. Now looking at Zoom, what I think is they're gonna have a correction. I think everybody rushed to them just because it's the excitement of, oh, everybody's Zooming, so I want to buy them. I'm not, I'm not picking them for that reason. They have, they're a very young company. They've only been um, IPO or publicly traded for about less than two years at this point. Going into, they're actually going into the one-year anniversary this month. And so the trajectory of them was heading up before any of this happened. And that's what I like about them. And this, aside from that is, the technology of Zoom and what they're providing isn't going anywhere. And from a COVID-19 standpoint, COVID-19 is just going to accelerate how we adopt um, digital communication. And once this smoke is cleared, not everybody's going to rush back to flying out or driving out or walking over or riding a bicycle to the next thing. It's going to be a slow progression, which is why, you know, even um, with the digital platform that we're on, everything's global which is probably, Leon, I'll say why probably Delta experienced more people flying than ever because you got to, you got to, you know, go online and TripAdvisor and look at this place in Indonesia that you never saw before, so now you want to go. You mm -hmm. saw this video from somebody and you're like, no, oh, I want to go there, it looks cool, or now you're doing business internationally where you couldn't have before because the technology wasn't there, so now you, you want to go see the people that you work with. All these things, I'm sure, contributed to people flying more. And once um, all the smoke clears, they are going to start flying again. But also, it's going to be a large segment of people who are like, you know what? This is pretty cool being able to work from home. I think mm -hmm. I'm going to continue then doing this. It's going to be a lot of businesses that are like, you know what? Our business overhead costs have been cut by 37%, 20%. Mm -hmm. 
because we don't have to get the cleaning company in to clean all the desks off. It's not as much trash. Trash collection goes down. We're not using much electricity. We're not using much heat. We're not looking, you know, we don't need as big of a building remote. So it's going to be a lot of reasons why some of these companies stay remote, which means it's going to have to be a platform that can handle the volume and also that is um, um, easy enough for people to use. And then there are other ones like GoToMeeting, um, Webinar Jam, and some others that WebEx. WebEx. But Zoom has, you know, um, brand awareness. And so by default, I personally feel like there's going to be a lot of people who move there. And to get it at 130, 120, I'm dollar cost averaging. And my anticipation is it's going to go down. I don't think it's just going to keep booming. But it's going to be a lot of false runs in the market for like the next 10, 12 months, where in false runs are when like the market, you, you see like all of a sudden it spikes 10%. And they're like, oh, it's over. We hit the floor. It's back just, to normal. We're yeah. back to normal. Everybody come outside and play. But then the market's like, whoa, I just had some people at institutions doing profit taking. It's going back down. Mm -hmm. it's going to, then the question becomes what we alluded to earlier. What is the real floor? And you really don't know until it's over. Even when it's over, you don't know if it's over. Right. right. So, you know, will it break resistance? I don't know. Will it break support? I don't know. And the goal is get in the market, stay in something that you can, um, you can stick with. In this environment, don't try to time the market if you're not like an extreme professional because you can get burned. And just make sure, um, give me that term again, Leon, risk. Risk capital. Yeah, make sure you're using risk capital, money you can lose. Let's just keep it simple. <laughs> so <laughs> make sure you invest the money that you can lose and just hope that you win. And But, you know, it's not a hope and a wish. You, you do it intelligently. Don't get too emotionally involved in the big sways and honestly, if you know you're the type of person that makes emotional based decisions, do not check your portfolio every day. It will stress you out. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we'll so say one thing on, on, on Zoom. <laughs> so just for everybody, um, Zoom, like Brent said, Zoom's ticker is ZM. There's a company out there with the ticker of Z-O-O-M, Zoom. That stock went through the roof because everyone thought it was Zoom video. So just be just be aware that the, the, the stock Brent's talking about is ZM. The ticker is ZM, not Z O O M. Okay. It went yeah. right to the roof. You can't make that, huh? I'm gonna give you this question that came out because I know you love answering stuff like this. The question is, what do you think about leveraging ETFs um, that follow indices? Um, I think they're great. Um, I think they're a way if if you're not into if you're not into the stock picking thing, um, and you don't really trust your ability to, to, to do research and to find um, quality companies, then yeah, ETFs are great. I mean, the, the greatest ETF out there is, um, is buying a, 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 a S&P or S&P 100 index fund uh, that tracks the S&P 500. And so, um, again, the market does about 10% a year on average, 10 to 12% a year on average. Um, if you want to get that, all you got to do is buy an ETF index fund and put your money to work there. Um, now, you're not going to make, now, again, if the market moves up 10%, 10% you have individual stocks that could do 10, 20, 30%. So you won't yeah. get that big, but just, you know, you still get it. You still yeah, get I'm not a fan. Um, I, I mean, I think ETFs are good for what Leon's saying, that mutual fund type scenario. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, imagine yourself um, chasing anything that's in front of you. Anything. If you're tracking, if you're tracking an animal, if you're tracking a person, you, what do you have to do in order to track them? Stay behind them. And so one of the things about when you have ETFs, they track an ind indice, but you never beat the indice. And I'm, I just like the fact that when I'm in the, when I'm in stock market, when I'm in the market, I have the ability to beat an mm -hmm. indice. And so I like them. I just don't like them as a only investment because you yeah, can yeah. the indice. Right. I agree. Yeah. They should, yeah, they definitely shouldn't be your only, well, never say they, they do, <laughs> never I do what they <laughs> I do <what> they want. <laughs> but for, for me, um, it would never be my only investment. I I, I own ETFs. I own I own S&P 500 ETF um, and some other ones and some technology ETFs. But I also own, I definitely own, I own more individual stocks than I do ETFs. Uh, to me, ETFs are just kind of a backdrop, you know, in case say I own Microsoft um, and and um, say tech, but say technology, say technology takes a hit um, or say, say technology is rising, but say my, my, my individual tech stocks are taking a hit. Well, I know I'm still backstopped by the ETF that's still rising, so it's a way to kind of balance your portfolio. But yeah, for me, by all means, it's not it's not a, it's not my only my only investment at all. 
Okay, and this is a question that came to me. Uh, what about the security issue inside of Zoom? Now, if you're talking about security from a standpoint of if it's HIPAA compliant or if it has a 256-bit encryption on every communication, or, you know, I'm not sure when you say security what you mean, but I'll say this. If I don't believe Zoom is HIPAA um, compliant right now, but even in the time we're talking COVID-19, right? Um, COVID-19 has lifted the HIPAA requirements on um, mass communication because they feel that it's more important to get people service from a health standpoint than worry about the compliance. Now, will that create nightmares later on? I don't know, maybe so. But it also, when we're talking about generic conversation and for people who are just communicating to pass information from one place to another, most communication doesn't need to be encrypted. Um, and if, if like today, if somebody steals this information, it's literally on Facebook. So why would we care? Um, a lot of communication that happens on the internet has no need to be secure. Now, the percentage of information that does need like a HIPAA compliant or top secret clearance, it's going to be on an internal server anyway. So that really wouldn't have been a play that most people would be looking at from an um, investing standpoint. So just to answer that question. And thank you for the question. Actually, you guys have great questions. So like I yeah. said, we're going to, um, if you guys can tell us like, you know, we would love to get this in a private group where we can go deeper. We would love to be part of a membership. Um, we would just like to hear what you guys have to say once a week, twice a month, you know, whatever it is, if you guys can direct messages to let us know what it is you will want. We're building out the, the company now and we want to create a community of people who can learn about different types of investing, learn primarily about stocks and they feel safe in that environment, just kind of being free with questions. So, you know, thank you for, it's been extreme engagement on this. I mean, Leon, you haven't been able to see the numbers, but it's been pretty consistently in the teens and we'll be on again. Um, yeah, we got people saying, add me to the group for sure. Like already. So James, oh, Jay, what's going on? And so um, some booyahs, but <laughs> it goes back to understand the market. Don't run from it. And right now is a great opportunity for you all to take advantage of dollar cost averaging. As we talked about, dollar cost average up, dollar cost average down. As Leon talked about it, he was able to get to a place where he was buying a stock at 40. He bought again at 20. And now his average price for that stock is 30. Dollar cost averaging can also happen on an um, a automated process where you just, over a certain period of time, set up your investment account that will draft money and invest it for you. And we're going to talk about stop limit, stop orders, limit orders, things of that nature that will take the emotion out of, you know, how you invest, which Leon talked about, because it'll trigger buy and sell on percentage or price moves. And most of the investment platforms have these options available. So you aren't up at night trying to think, well, what if I miss a complete fallout or fall to the bottom? If you have a stop order in place, it's going to trigger automatically. And now you don't have to worry about that happening. Um, so we're, all these things will be discussed in our community. Um, we'll talk about it sometimes on these lives. But the questions are still coming in. People are saying they look forward to the group. I appreciate it. And our approach is going to be just like this. It's, it's going to be us talking off what we know. And we have some friends that have been in the market doing some incredible things. We're going to bring in some of those, leverage our relationships to bring you guys the best information possible. So with that being said, thank you, Leon. You got any closing comments? We had 32 comments, bro. Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. Good, good engagement. Um, kind of like I said before, just, you know, use, use history as your guide. This is, you know, it's not the end of the world. Um, this, this is, this is wholly an investment opportunity that we may not see again in our lifetime, or at least won't end for. Leon, let me just let me disrupt you for a minute so you can say some more. Do you remember what you told me about the guy who was in, um, took 10,000, was it 10,000? Mm. It was, did what? It was Warren Buffett. Like it was somebody who was an alternative investor. It wasn't Warren Buffett. You were did like, nobody knows this guy's name. Oh, oh, um, Jim Simmons. Jim Simmons. Um, yes. So Jim, yeah, Jim, his, uh, Jim, Jim, Jim Simmons, he's the, um, He's a founder of a hedge fund called uh, Renaissance Technology. And everyone's heard of Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, I think over the last like 30, 40 years, has averaged 30, about 33%. I think the 20, either mid 20s to high 20s and low 30s in return. Um, but Jim Simmons has almost doubled that over 40 years. The dude has averaged, I think it's roughly 40 to 60% over 40 years. Now remember, that's an average. That means he's done 200%. 
and maybe some years he's done minus 20%, but his average over, over the last 30, 40 years has been almost 60, like 40 to 60%, unheard of, unheard yeah. of. And, and the way he does it, um, it's kind of it's, it's kind of it's kind of my way of uh, the way I look at things is, is, is data driven. Um, he has what what's called a quant fund, um, and quant funds um, well, basically what they do is they just bring a whole heap of data, crunch the numbers, and then have it spit out a, um, a you know particular list of stocks based on a whole bunch of different criteria, um, unstructured structured data, a whole whole bunch of things. But but Jim Simmons, if you want to look up a guy who's killed it, Jim Jim Simmons Re- Renaissance Technology would be um, something to look up and just research for some information. He's beat yeah. one. And the and reason why I, I was like, you got to bring it up because people don't think these things exist. Um, oh, you know, hey, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, I've had investments that I've done personally that have done 800% rate of return over a two year period. And right. even when I bought Google, I bought it at $500 a share and everybody told me I was crazy. Right. <laughs> like, why would you buy Google at $500 a share? And I, I might've I might have been in my early, late 20s, late 20s, early 30s, I don't know. And I was like, well, it's Google. Don't you Google everything? Right. No, no, right. I just, use, use, use what you know, buy what you know. Right. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I Google something every day. Like I literally every day I Google. It's a, it's a word now. Google it. Right. Google it. Is, is that was my whole reason for buying it. And I think I don't know what Google's trading at now, but that one share did a two for one split. And now each share of Google might be over a thousand dollars a share. Yeah. So it was over a three like a three hundred percent rate of return on that one share one share that's all i could afford right no let me change that statement that's all i that's all i was willing to lose right yeah and yeah. Right. that yeah. one share is, is so that there are picks out there guys that can can really change your life i mean i was able to really get my first house with, through, the, through this process but they're bumps too it was times where i was like yo i got to liquidate accounts because i don't mm-hmm. know where the next money is coming from so and like how, how like you said there are a lot of people there are a lot of people that aren't aren't fans of ETFs and index funds because of what you just said. Stocks can return, you know, hundreds of, of percentage percentage of the time. And of course they can lose hundreds of percentage too. Yeah. But with, with with an index fund, you're you're generally just gonna match the market. So whatever the market does, 10%, 12%, you're gonna make 10, 10, 12 percent. Whereas if you bought an individual stock, you can make three, four hundred percent, um, but that you won't make an ETF. So I mean to your point, Brent, yeah, I mean I know you're not a fan of them as a sole investment. Um, I'm not either. I work. It's definitely work. Work. You have a place. Yeah, they have a place, right? It should be part of part of a portfolio, but not solely a portfolio. Portfolio. Hold up, somebody just asked. All right, this is the last question. <laughs> this is last last question. <laughs> somebody asked, um, "Do we rec- how many books we recommend?" And I'm thinking, like, um, uh, you got any books you recommend, Lee? Hey, no, uh, I mean honestly, no, because I can't either. To me, books are are typically someone's. So the market is the market is is a living, breathing entity right so if you read a book and i'm not and i'm not saying books are bad i'm not i'm not saying don't read books i'm saying just again everything i say is free. <laughs> and the market is a living breathing entity and it changes year to year um it changes day to day so if you read a book from 20 years ago about an investment strategy and try to apply that to today's market right now you, you have high frequency trading um you have uh market makers that have left the market banks can't trade anymore liquidity is down from what it was 20 years ago it's not the same market so to try to implement a strategy that, that a guy wrote 20 years ago when he made, you know, $200 million out of a dollar, you know, I don't, I don't really know if that's going to work today. So, I mean, everything I've, everything I've learned, I've, you know, I've learned on my own Google, I mean, like I said, Google is your friend. Um, and then a lot of times trial and error. Um, I mean, I lost a lot of money trial and error, made a lot of money trial and error too. And I've kind of gotten to a balance, right? I know it works for me. Um, so as far as books, I would know for me, no, I, there are no books I can recommend. Yeah, I would say um, a book that I like was Rich Man in Babylon. Now, it doesn't talk about stocks, but it starts to program your mentality. And one of the things you guys don't know, and what we, Leon and I didn't say, is when we were in college, when people were walking around with headphones listening to, like, Onyx, Leon and I were walking around with headphones listening to Zig Ziglar and Bill Nightingale. And so we were really programming our minds to not be affected by loss. And mm-hmm. so for us, loss doesn't hurt like it does most people. We, it's, it's, just, it's just part of the course for us. So we're built yeah. for it. And not yeah. everybody's built for it. So that's why we're creating the Investment Education Academy. And because we, we want to teach you guys how to not look at all this crap you see on the internet where people are running around in Lamborghinis and all that. I mean, <laughs> I bought a share. I bought a share. Man, and actually, a guy just posted 
It's um trading at about one thousand one hundred dollars a share now. What's that? Um Google. Oh Google, yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's I mean, so that's two thousand two hundred dollars a share for me because it I, my my price is the total um the aggregate of the two stocks because mm -hmm. they Google split. It's a whole other conversation. So right. one five hundred dollars shares now worth two thousand two hundred dollars, and I bought one share. So imagine if I just put three thousand, two thousand, a thousand dollars in. I'm paying off my car at this point. Mm -hmm. And so these are very small things that are applicable to your life versus come get this Lamborghini. Nobody cares about that. Like you can get the same place I'm gonna get to. Right, go, right. This <laughs> <nice car." laughs> so anyway, <laughs> with that being said, guys, I gotta run because because of COVID-19, I am the aftercare dad. So I need to get home and make sure I am there for aftercare for the kids. But we, we'll be back either next Wednesday or Wednesday after that. Um, if you guys wanna tell us the frequency, you would love to see these. Um, this is this is me and Leon's life. As you can see, we can talk about this forever. And <laughs> the goal is really to bring everybody into the fold because it's a lot that can happen when you have somebody that cares and understands the market talking to you, feeding into you. Sometimes it's just about getting in the right environment to change your life. And people's lives will be changed once this is over, if if they invest properly while it's happening. So that being said, thank you everybody for watching. It's been an amazing turnout. Leon Shaniqua say hello and thank you for putting this information out. Hello, hello. And we will talk to everybody next week or the week after. All right, bye.